Newman. And, and Senator Newman, you bet. There you go. And Limmer, okay. Wonderful. Well, we're going to call this meeting to order. Just to have one item on the agenda today, members, and it's a pre presentation from MMB on the updated budget projection that was released on um, Tuesday. So uh, we have uh, Commissioner Myron Franz with us, Dr. Laura Kolumbakitis from the, our state economist, and Deputy Director uh, Britta Rattan with us. And Dominic Washington has the interim budget projection slides that we are going to be working off. And uh, if you can, perhaps hold your questions till after the presentation, um, and then we can get some questions in. So with that, who would like to start? Commissioner, Dr. Kolumbakitis, Ms. Rattan. Good morning, thank you. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Thank you all for taking time out uh, to listen to our presentation. Uh, we'll go through this slide deck and uh, then be ready for questions. You know, it, it's um, obviously a unique situation for us to do an interim budget projection like this. Uh, and as we look through uh, what's happening, the economic conditions here are going to present us with an extraordinary situation. Uh, a lot of you I've worked with over the years and we all work together to create this uh, budget reserve and to be prepared for an economic downturn, but no one obviously predicted it would be this sort of a situation with both a pandemic and a, an economic downturn. So we wanted to provide you all with the best possible information uh, in May uh, to, to make decisions about our state resources and, and the budget. So that's why uh, we're doing this and, and both uh, uh, Dr. Klumbakitis and Director Raytan will describe the essence of the, the data that we do have and also the idea of why we've limited this uh, budget projection to the current biennium 2020 and 2021, uh, because of the nature of uh, the uncertainty and, and uh, but we do know obviously that there's gonna be an effect in the next biennium too. Uh, they'll, they'll talk about the major revenues and expenditures that have been updated, but as we all know now, it's a $2.4 billion uh, budget deficit. It's being, this is being projected before we use any of the uh, budget reserve. So what we'll do, uh, we'll go through this, and then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of the tools and, that we have and, and, and how we can work together uh, to, uh, to solve this uh, rebalancing, if you will. So I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Kolumbakitis. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, Dr. Kolumbakitis. Good morning, good Senator. Good morning. Um, glad, glad to be here. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, so I'm going to uh, present uh, some information about the U.S. economic outlook, then I'm going to move to Minnesota, and then I'll, uh, as uh, the Commissioner said, I'm going to talk about the revenue, uh, the change in the revenue projection. So uh, the, the U U.S. outlook, the slide you see here, is the level of real GDP. Um, the history, the dark line shows the history and the April outlook by IHS Market, our macroeconomic consulting firm. And then the dotted line shows the February outlook. So where we, the path we thought we were on in February. And of course the outbreak of COVID-19 and the measures taken to prevent its spread have dramatically weakened the US outlook for growth uh, since our forecast was prevented, presented in February. IHS is now forecasting a three quarter uh, recession, three quarter decline in GDP resulting in a five 5.4% decline in real GDP in 2020. And so in contrast, in February, they were forecasting 2.1% growth in 2020. Um, I've mentioned before that consumer spending accounts for two thirds of, of real GDP and that during this record expansion that we were in, consumer spending was really the driver of that. So throughout the years, uh, investment, which is another component of GDP, had uh, had had been volatile, had gone down, had gone up, but consumer spending had just stayed solid. Um, but that consumer spending has been hit hard by this crisis. Temporary business closures, social distancing, volatile financial markets, rising unemployment, declining wage income, all of those contribute to a 5.5% projected decline in consumer spending this year. Uh, so uh, IHS, so let me, let me give you some of the um, the assumptions underlying this uh, this forecast before I, or this the IHS forecast before I uh, talk a little bit more about it. So IHS notes that their outlook depends critically on the path of the pandemic, uh, and here's what they expect about the path of the pandemic. And implicitly, we are adopting those um, those assumptions um, when uh, we accept their um, their projection. So they expect the spread of COVID nineteen to peak and then dissipate in early summer. 
allowing social distancing restrictions to be lifted during late summer or early fall. Economic recovery begins then, and real GDP growth turns positive toward the end of the year. So real GDP is forecast to grow 6.3% uh, next year. So if you follow the dark line, the solid line on the graph, you can see that IHS expects GDP to reach its pre-pandemic level. So the level that we were before this, this decline occurred um, in mid-21. Uh, and then you can, but you can see in the graph three quarters. So each data point on this graph is a quarter, three quarters of negative growth, of decline. And then it starts coming back up and it reaches its pre pandemic level in mid 21. But within our horizon, GDP does not get back to where it would have been without the pandemic. We never get back to that dotted line. Simply some amount of GDP, some amount of economic activity is simply lost forever. Um, now I could show you, uh, and I considered showing you, but, it, but in the interest of time, I'm, I'm not showing you a ton of graphs, but I could show you graphs for lots of other variables. For instance, um, that investment, which is a, a component of GDP, that, uh, that uh, influences um, Minnesota's economic outlook and our revenue, revenue projection. Um, re consumer spending which of course is a, is a major component of GDP and also influences our sales tax forecast. Total wage and salary income, which influences our income tax forecast. Every one of those graphs, if I showed it to you in levels, like I am showing you the GDP graph, would look the same. So they would all have a big dip this year, a gradual, well, a, a, actually a fairly, fairly um, a sharp upturn uh, next year, but it, they would never get back to that dotted line. So never get back to the path we thought we were on. Uh, again, some more uh, information about assumptions here. The April outlook reflects fiscal and monetary policy measures taken prior to the first week of April, including the impact of the CARES Act. Um, and the first, the U.S. outlook incorporates the first round of the um, PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, because in the interim, we knew that the second round of PPP had been passed. We did incorporate the second round into our uh, revenue forecast. The shock to the US economy from the pandemic is unprecedented in modern American history. And the economic outlook is exceptionally uncertain and volatile. Economic outcomes will depend critically, as I said, on the pandemic's course. And as the pandemic, as our understanding of the pandemic changes, and as IHS's uh, view of the pandemic's course changes, their economic outlook is going to change. But it also depends on the prospects for an effective treatment and vaccine. Uh, to, it depends on government restrictions on economic activity and consumers and businesses' responses as those restrictions are lifted. And in this outlook, the primary thing that changes is how consumers and businesses respond uh, to when they feel confident and safe uh, opening up businesses and returning to uh, to spending the way they used to. Uh, it uh, also depends on fiscal and monetary policies, which everything that's happened so far is incorporated into this outlook, but we don't know the, the actual impact of what's happened, what the government has done already is uncertain, and it is also uncertain what the government is going to do next. So as those things change, IHS's outlook is going to change. Um, so in short, the U.S. economic outlook is going to remain volatile and uncertain for some time. And to be clear, through, through the remainder of our, um, our biennium, for sure. Uh, so let me turn to uh, Minnesota's outlook. Minnesota entered the crisis uh, with high demand for labor. As you recall, we had uh, a tight labor market, high demand for labor, low unemployment, uh, we had persistent employment growth throughout the economic expansion, but our, if you'll also recall that our employment growth had slowed, it had be, been um, become limited by labor supply. The disease outbreak, the restrictions applied to slow its spread, and the U.S. and global economic contra contractions have rocked Minnesota's economy and generated conditions that, as I said, will remain volatile for as long as the pandemic persists and as long as the U.S. outlook remains uncertain. So. Uh, a big challenge in, um, in constructing this projection is that economic data naturally, under normal circumstances, lag what we see in our daily lives, going about our business and seeing what's going on in the economy. Uh, and so it is, um, it's, that makes it difficult to, at this point in time, precisely measure how the pandemic 
uh, has affected Minnesota's economy. We don't have very many data points that say that are post pandemic. A lot of the data points we have are still pre crisis. Um, but one frequently published statistic that reflects the labor market impact is the number of people who have applied, who've made initial claims for unemployment insurance benefits. Um, and according to Deed, since mid-March, an unprecedented 600,000 Minnesotans have applied for benefits. So that indicates a really dramatic increase in the number of layoffs by Minnesota employers. So related to that, in this chart, we're showing uh, total Minnesota wage and salary income. So what that the variable we're looking at here is the total number, if you take all of the payrolls of all of the employers in the state of Minnesota and add them up, that's the variable we're measuring. And the height of the bar in each case shows annual growth in that measure. So in the GDP chart, I was showing you the dollar value, the level. Now I'm showing you what I usually show you, which is growth rates. So the dark bars are our history and the striped bars are our new projection for Minnesota. So as employers reduce hours, cut pay, and lay off and furlough workers, we estimate that total wage and salary income in Minnesota will decline 5.9% this year. We expect it to grow a small amount in 21, but in our projection, it doesn't reach its pre-pandemic level until 22. Now turning to the new revenue projection, uh, total general fund revenues for the current biennium, so that's the next slide. Uh, total re uh, general fund revenues for the current biennium are now projected to be $3.611 billion less than our February forecast. And uh, estimates for every all of the major tax types have declined. Uh, ind uh, individual in income tax receipts are now projected to be $1.659 billion less than the February forecast. And that decrease decreases primarily because of that decline in the projected decline in wage and salary income that I showed you, but also declines in forms of non-wage income. And that includes capital gains, it includes business income and other forms of non-wage income. Sales tax revenue is now projected to be $1.351 billion less than the prior forecast. And that projection is consistent with the contraction or decline in consumer spending that I showed you earlier, uh, or that I talked about earlier. The corporate tax is projected to generate $405 million less than the prior forecast, and that's based on a lower forecast for corporate profits. So in the, the next slide, I, I list some of the risks uh, to this forecast, some of which I've already talked about. So related to the path of the pandemic is the path of consumer and business confidence. Some businesses that have temporarily closed or seen declines in revenues are facing significant uncertainty about reopening or even survival. And it's not clear when consumers will have the means, so the money, um, and the trust in public safety to get back to spending. And so that, that, is, that is a source of uncertainty is, uh, is regard, almost not regardless, but, but in, in conjunction with what governments do in terms of lifting orders, um, how are consumers and businesses going to respond at that point? Uh, and so that's, that's a source of uncertainty. Increased financial market volatility can hinder consumer spending by lower, lowering household wealth. So we've talked about that negative wealth effect from, uh, from the equity market uh, that can affect uh, consumer spending. The impact of federal fiscal and monetary policy, as I said, is uncertain, as is uh, ad any additional federal support directly to, uh, to the state. Uh, and directly to uh, to households. Delays in Minnesota tax payments that we, Minnesota has allowed a number of revenue uh, payment delays uh, for uh, businesses and businesses and individuals uh, uh, to, to, to give them some support or some, some leeway uh, during the crisis. Uh, what those delays in payments do from our point of view though, is that um, they delay signals that we normally use to uh, determine how the economy is playing through to revenue streams. So we look monthly at sales tax and we look, um, and we look at income tax payments to see how, we're, how is revenue being affected. And so delays in those payments also delay and muddy those signals for us. Uh, it is uh, likely that things won't be clearer for us until late in the summer. 
And then of course we've got 14 months in this in this biennium and it's going to be a bumpy ride. A lot of things can change. Uh, and even small changes in growth rates in, in revenue streams can have a big effect on this biennium, uh, the budget situation for this biennium and the next. So I'll pass it on to budget director, Brito Rayton. Thank you, Dr. Kolombakidis. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Uh, budget director, Rayton, good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Can you hear me? Very good. Okay, good. Um, so I'm just going to quickly walk through the expenditure side of this budget projection. And our overall projected spending is up $391 million relative to our previous projection in February. This change really has two parts. Um, the first of which is the spending enacted by the legislature since February. And then the second is the projected changes in spending due to the re-estimates that we did as part of this interim budget projection. So first, the legislature enacted, the governor signed into law, $550 million in increased general fund spending so far this session. And as you all know, most of the spending is entirely focused on COVID-19 response. Um, so over the coming weeks, some of this spending will likely be redirected to the Coronavirus Relief Fund, or we may seek reimbursement through FEMA, which provides a 75% match on um, many of our disaster response um, spending. So the general fund impact of that $550 million may be reduced, but this estimate assumes that all of that is applied against the general fund because that's current law. Uh, the second component of the overall change is the updated budget projection for health and human services spending. And that update is shown in the projection change column. And it shows a decline in anticipated spending since February of 160 million. Now, Health and Human Services is the only bill area that we did an updated projection for with this May projection. And that's because the Health and Human Service spending area tends to be more volatile with the economy. And it's also counter cyclical to the economy, meaning typically um, costs increase um, as we go into economic downturns because we have more participation in public programs. Um, so the underlying economic data does drive increased participation projections with this estimate, particularly in fiscal year 21. Um, that participation change drives increased cost, es cost estimates of 164 million. However, uh, those cost increases are offset by additional federal revenue that we are receiving or federal funding, I should say, that we're receiving in our medical assistance program since the February forecast. So Congress passed in um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act an increase to our federal match for medical assistance. And that expected growth in federal funding in uh, this fiscal year is 330 million. So that federal funding reduces the state expenditures and then more than offsets the increased costs that are due to the increases in participation in public programs. So combined, that results in a spending uh, projection that's reduced relative to February by 160 million for health and human services. So when you combine the enacted legislation and the projected changes, you get to an overall increase in spending of 391 million. And as I mentioned before, um, we didn't do re-estimates on the other bill areas with this projection. Um, so all the changes you see in those other bill areas are just reflective of the enacted legislation this session. And so that's why they're only in that column. So then turning to the next slide, um, this brings together both the revenue side and the expenditure side of the budget projection. So as Dr. Kolumbakidis uh, walked through, the revenue projection is down 3.611 billion compared to our, our previous estimate. And then as I walked through, uh, the spending estimate is up 391 million and that's in that total change column. Um, the other thing to note in terms of the change, the stadium reserve estimate has decreased by 63 million. It still leaves a projected 66 million in the stadium reserve by the end of fiscal year 21, but it is a dramatic decrease from our previous projection and that's because um, of a significant change in our overall anticipated gambling revenues since February. So then overall, all of these changes combined uh, leave us with the projected deficit in FY 2021 
of $2.426 billion, and you can see that in the bottom right-hand corner of this slide. And then I can pass it back to Commissioner Franz. Thank you, Deputy Director. I appreciate that. Commissioner Franz. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Klumakitis, and thank you, uh, Director Raytan. So just a few uh, comments here, and then we'll open it up for questions, because we really want to hear from you and the concerns that you have. You know, we, how did we get here? How did we get to the $2.359 billion budget reserve? Well, it took a lot of work over a lot of years. I want to thank the legislature and Governor uh, Dayton and Governor Walls, all, everyone, and all of you for standing by that, uh, that program to make sure that we contributed to the surplus every November if we had a we had a budget surplus and contributing to the reserve every November by putting a third of that surplus into the reserve. And, and so that's why it's, it is where it is. And so I think we all deserve a, a good uh, thank you for doing that and, and appreciate the work you all did. I think the other thing that we've tried to do over the years, and we've all talked about the tails, right? So we, we try to budget for four years, not two years, and uh, keep that long view, try to make sure that our spending is not uh, uh, exceeded by our that our revenues are not exceeded by our spending. And I think that the thing now is to uh, determine you know, what we do uh, given the situation. Our goal on Tuesday was to present to you all and to the public the problem and the nature of, of where we are and then to discuss how do we go about solving that. Uh, one of the things that um, this does obviously, as you know, with the budget uh, projection of a deficit gives the governor the authority to use a reserve we want to talk about how much of the reserve you use, how to use it, and, and those are questions that are before all of us. Some people have asked about the, you know, the use of, of unallotment, and, and as you know, unallotment is available to the governor after all the you know, reserve has been depleted. So that's another uh, issue for us to, to talk about. We were concerned about the long-term effect, obviously. We know, even though we're not projecting what's going to happen in 22, 23, we know that this is going to have an effect obviously probably a serious negative effect. And so we have both the 14 months left of this biennium and then we have to consider what's happening in the future. So we all kind of want to work together on that. If you go to the next slide, I'll just, uh, we'll get into this in any detail. We've talked about this before. This just shows us the complexity of how we need to work together to, to manage all these different funds in a way that maximizes the use for the state of Minnesota, maximizes the response to the COVID-19 emergency and also protects Minnesota's budget going forward. You know, one of the things I will say and um, is that I, I, I'm hopeful that there will be additional federal action. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, the, the, um, Senator Rosen and, and the leadership of the Senate for sending the letter to the Minnesota congressional delegation suggesting that there's more work to be done and inviting them to participate more and more with what we're doing, but suggesting that, yes, there is another step that we could we could uh, use for the state to, to recover. And all the states, frankly, need this. Moody's uh, released uh, last week, was it earlier this week? I'm sorry, I can't keep track of the weeks. Moody's released uh, not that long ago, a uh, statement about the fact that they're, they're looking at the public sector uh, as a negative outlook now. So uh, they just did that recently. And so they said two things could really change their view of the, of the public sector as negative. And number one would be the, the new vaccine, uh, a vaccine and or new treatments could help with the recovery and response to COVID. And they said the other thing could be a stimulus package by Congress going to the states because they felt like the uh, member in 2009, we had the ARRA, American Recovery and, uh, and uh, Reinvestment Act uh, provided that, that stimulus. And so that's, I think, something that we um, could really use as well. So we have a lot of uh, a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, we're in some challenging times here. We have some difficult decisions, and um, we really have a short time to decide what we're going to do this session. And I say this session because I, the governor, I think, mentioned this is not a one and done sort of a thing. That we're going to need to continue to work with the legislature in the future as events change. And you know, the numbers are going to change. We know that they're changing today. They're changing tomorrow. And so we're going to need to work with you. Uh, on a regular basis to update you all and to talk about what uh, what are the best steps forward because none of us have been through this before and collectively I think we can make the best decision. So with that, um, I'm ready to turn it over to questions, uh, Chair. Thank you very much, Commissioner France. Appreciate that. Um, a little sobering news for us all. Yeah. Here. <clears throat> My question before we turn it over to Senator, Senator Benson, the Senator Cohen, 
has a question, I believe Senator Nelson, but I was, I just wanted to drill down a little bit more on our bond rating and how that, um, and what we should be looking as far as a range for our debt service for a bonding bill that we are uh, hopefully going to be crafting and getting out here shortly. So um, can you explain a little bit about that? Have, has that affected our bond rating this and all the other states? Or are they just kind of waiting to see number one? Number two, should we take a fresh new look at that debt service? Great question, uh, Madam Chair. I think first of all, uh, they're kind of in a wait and see uh, mode right now. They, As I mentioned, they did uh, put a negative outlook on the sector, which is a problem. But they, I think one of the things they want to do, we've heard from some of them is that what they, what they want to do, the credit agencies is watch and see what states do. How do they respond to this emergency? So as always, we've talked about this before, part of what uh, credit agencies look at for um, states and a, to be a triple A state is that you have a plan. You, you manage these situations, you manage these unusual situations and uh, they respect that. So I think uh, they'll be watching us in terms of what do we do? When do we do it? Uh, so we don't know, to answer your question more directly, we do not know what they're gonna do and when they're gonna do it. Uh, they've just said that they're watching. And, uh, but I got, we've gotten the impression that it's not gonna be imminent, that they're gonna give us some time to respond. Uh, and the other thing too is to think about the, um, the bonding bill, as we've talked a lot about that before, about the uh, opportunity for Minnesota to invest in the future through bonding, uh, through borrowing on its uh, revenue stream to get low cost money to invest in these infrastructure packages that take two, three, four years, especially now with the job situation. So the key now is we have a situation where we're in a deficit. So if we add more to the debt, more spending to the deficit, which is, as you mentioned, the, uh, the annual debt service is adding more uh, debt to or adding more spending to the, the budget, we have to decide what's that going to compete against. Or do we, do we rate? So it's a math problem. We have revenue. Do we raise revenue? We have expenditures. Do we cut expenditures? Because the, the, the equal sign has got to be using the reserve and, and then adding some spending if necessary, like here, to increase the deficit, but then making the problem even more difficult. So I think it's a challenge. We still are looking at, at the bonding bill as something we think we should do. I think we've talked about this uh, Madam Chair, I think it's something we think we can do and can be afforded within our, our limit now, more limited resources. Uh, we have, um, I think the, the bonding, the uh, credit rating agencies will take a look at what we do and to make sure that we don't overspend or that we don't overborrow. So uh, I don't have the exact number of, we, we don't know what, what they'll view, uh, what size of bonding bill they'll view. I think it's, we have to decide with given the deficit, how much more do we want to add to that deficit with the additional spending? We still believe that a, a robust bonding bill of over a billion dollars, uh, and you know ours is currently at a 2.6 total with all various instruments in there. So we would like to continue to work with the legislature and, and come to some agreement about, about what we all feel comfortable with. Thank you, Commissioner. And one more question, members, and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, for for uh, Dr. Columbakitis, your budget projection unknowns is there one single factor that, is it the consumer on business confidence, the, uh, the federal support? Is there anything that could possibly uh, show greater signs and pull us up to our projected growth that we had going forward after 2020 mm -hmm. here? Is there anything that you see? And would a bonding bill, a hefty bonding bill perhaps push that even higher, that confidence? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members, so regarding the U.S. outlook, the, the, biggest, the biggest factor there is the pandemic. And uh, so the, the upside, there's, there's more downside potential to the U.S. outlook than there is upside. Um, but the upside potential has to do with um, the disease itself and vaccines and treatments. And so, you know, that, that's something, something that that you can necessarily do anything about. Well, maybe there, maybe there is, but um, that's the thing that will help uh, soften the blow, soften the downside and bring the upside up faster. Um, but that's a U.S. issue. Um, in the state, uh, as you know, that when as uh, the commissioner alluded to, the, the state has limited ability to, to um, in, 
infuse money into the economy in order to uh, to stimulate it and to cause growth because we have to balance the budget. And so it's, it's a zero sum game. And so stimulus from the federal government, more help from the federal government um, for the economy is would be beneficial for, for certain, but direct benefit to the state to help replace the revenues that we are bound to lose. That will help the state uh, be able to protect more needed services and keep um, you know, keep government workers employed so that they can consume. So um, the not much of that is directly in your in your purview uh, regarding a, a bonding bill. You know, you know, the commissioner has, I think, uh, characterized this correctly that it will be welcome once you know as, as we as we move through this cycle to have opportunities to employ people creating infrastructure, for, needed infrastructure for the state of Minnesota. But that increases, an in, in, increase in, um, in debt service adds to the uh, budget problem and competes with other things. So it's a balancing act that, um, you know, that, that you all need to, need to sort out. But the, the biggest issue is the path of the disease and then relate, very much related to that is how are businesses and households going to respond going forward this long into the restrictions that they've been in as restrictions are lifted uh, you know whatever that pace is what is nor how what is normal going to look like and how slowly or quickly are we going to get to it mm -hmm. thank you dr Columbakitis. so we have several people up uh senators uh, senator benson um i have a long list so i'll try to keep it short. Um, I don't see an analysis in here of what's going to happen when we hit a second wave and we have to um, resume some of the some of the tighter protocols. So I think that is something that needs to be part of a forward-looking analysis as it pertains to HHS. Um, is the 100 million from the Blue Ribbon Commission assumed to be happening? Because um, we can't count it twice. If we don't meet the goal, it comes out of the reserve. If we do meet the goal, we can't go back to those cuts then um, should health and human services be part of a balanced budget solution going forward. Because while we have reserves, using all of them isn't necessarily prudent. So I need to know how you're handling that 100 million. Um, is the increase in utilization, is that projected to grow or do we assume that it's stable? You know what, and, Senator Benson, let's get an answer on those two and we'll let, I'll okay. turn it right back to you. Deputy Director, are you in line for the Blue Ribbon? Yes. <laughs> or Commissioner? Oh, oh, okay. I'll let the yes, Director Ray Tong. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, because, because we didn't do an updated projection of 22-23, that's where um, an assumption about the Blue Ribbon Commission would, would come into play. Um, at this point, it, the assumption is that the savings are generated, but you are correct that it is backed by the budget reserve. So if we used the entirety of the budget reserve in 2021, it wouldn't be there to back savings if those savings weren't realized. Um, so that's correct. But we don't have an assumption built in about that because that is built into our 22-23 budget estimate right now, and we did not reproject that. And then um, maybe Dr. Kolumbakitis, do you want to talk about the second wave piece? Dr. Kolumbakitis? Sure, um, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Benson. Uh, in, that's, it's a great question to, to, to focus on that the, the US macroeconomic forecast that we used uh, to underlie our projections does not assume a second wave. So you saw that, you know, that the pattern of GDP was sort of like a Nike swoosh, it comes down and then comes back up. There's no second wave in that. Uh, and so to the extent, if that happens, or if it starts to look like it's more likely to happen, then that will change the outlook. And we don't have, we haven't done a projection with that, um, with that assumption in it. Okay, thank you. Senator Benson. Madam Chair, this is my last question. Um, on the healthcare access fund, I see that we have projected a, a decline. I'm looking for the number. Um, 
of 7.4% reduction is that primarily due to a decrease in the um, elective procedures? Is there something else driving that? And also the commissioner took executive action to forgive um, unpaid premiums at eligibility redetermination. Is that calculated in the health care access fund uh, projections? Budget Director Bertan. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, the, the governor's executive orders are projected in this budget projection. Um, the resource reduction in the Health Care Access Fund is um, based on what we are actually seeing in terms of the, the receipts into the Health Care Access Fund, but it's also modeled on the data from IHS about um, health care consumption going forward. Um, my understanding is there is some um, data lag there, so similar to what Dr. Kolumbakidis was highlighting about data lag, we don't we don't have um, great data at this point, so we will need to continue to monitor that situation. So, it's, but uh, most of the reduction in that fund is on the on the source side. Senator, um, Madam Chair, it appears to me the Health Care Access Fund could actually get worse um, if we continue to forgive premiums and it doesn't look like um, I, I, it will be interesting to see where this goes in the next couple of months because our healthcare system projected significant losses over the time that elective procedures were frozen and I don't see that number reflected here so I think there's a little more digging to do I think the healthcare access fund is going to look worse the next time we review it um, than than it does right now. But thank you. Those were my questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Benson. Next up, we have Senator Cohen. Senator Cohen, I've got several questions. Do you want to go ahead with Senator Engelbertson and Senator Lumber and come back to me? That'd be fine if you're if you're fine with that. You bet. Yeah. Senator Nelson. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, um, Commissioner and uh, Dr. Colin, Colin Um I'm, I'm just uh, stunned and um, I think we all are, and it's just the reality where we live right now. But, but I'd, I'd like you to speak a little bit uh, to the um, E12 uh, funding uh, and, and special concerns there. You know, that, uh, is the largest percent of our state budget, and it's really been turned on its head as far as how how uh, we are operating. And you know, uh, districts uh, are clearly um, have financial concerns, whether they be those additional costs uh, associated with school health and safety, or the loss of fee revenue, or securing the internet and technology access for students and families. Th these are major major, major issues. And I'm wondering if you can uh, perhaps uh, shine a light on a couple of these uh, issues particularly. Um, one of the uh, issues affecting our schools uh, regarding the, the shutdown, the distance learning, moving to distance learning, and then the extended distance learning, of course, has been the loss of fees that they have received. So while we have worked very hard at the state to make sure that our funding continues uh, to our schools, just like they had planned on uh, all of that state funding, but our schools are also funded from other areas as well. And I, I'm wondering if, um, if Commissioner, if you have a, um, a number of, of those lost fees that are no longer coming into our schools, whether it be from uh, fees for events that are no longer happening or nutrition for meals that are no longer being served. Those seem to be two of the big areas. Do you have some idea uh, how that's impacting our school budgets? Uh, if they're continuing to spend uh, their total spend, but only the state revenue side has been held constant. Commissioner Friend. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'll start, but I'll let uh, Budget Director Raytan take over. I think the key, and you've hit on a really uh, important point, there are so many different um, activities and agencies and, and, and programs that are funded in part by revenues, right? And so uh, all of the, and all those revenues, almost all of them, have been affected negatively. So one of the things that we have to do is examine all revenue or fund-supported activities and 
and you know the legacy funds we're, we're looking at those as you all know the highway transportation fund i mean there are so many funds that receive these um, funds that, that are now down and we have to adjust that but in particular in the education area i'll let uh, budget director Raton ask that i don't have the particular information about that one Thank you, Commissioner. And to add to that, um, Senator Cohen and I sit on the Guthrie board. As you know, yes. all those, the, the Institute of Art, everybody is suffering because of lack of revenue and, and their dollars, the dollars coming into the legacy account is going to be um, slowed also along with yes. everything else. So how do we handle those finances? Uh, Budget Director to Britton. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I. I don't have a number um, for the uh, the amount of fees the districts are losing, but I know that MDE is is closely looking at that issue, and there is a work group. Um, so I can try to see if they if they've collected that. There is a work group through the SEOC that's looking at child care and education issues, um, and so I know they are also looking at the loss of fee revenue at districts. Um, one point I would like to highlight as we're talking about the need for more federal support, the coronavirus relief fund unfortunately can't be used to backfill for lost revenues, both at the state level or at the local level. And that is one um, very complicating factor, I think, with that funding source, because that is really um, the point at which a lot of entities are struggling. It's, it's that lost revenue piece because we can hold the state support constant, but it's the lost revenue that is really a, a, a difficulty. Thank you. Thank you. Senator. Uh, Madam, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just to follow up, uh, and that is a, a key point that uh, those the CARES funding cannot be used for uh, lost revenue because I know a number of our schools uh, for some time had been told uh, keep everything constant, uh, make sure uh, everyone's employed, uh, and all of those hours that we thought they would be working uh, needed to continue uh, even post-COVID. And I know there was some thought that perhaps the uh, Coronavirus Relief Act could kind of come in and help our schools uh, backfill uh, th that, and I, and I understand that that's not possible. So that is a, is a challenge. Um, so, but on the... Um, on the uh, education stabilization grants, part of that CARES, um, I'd, I'd like to know how much um, has come in already from the federal government? Uh, has it arrived uh, at here in Minnesota uh, at MMB and how much uh, uh, or any of it uh, have been has been allocated so far? Thank you, Senator Nelson. Uh, we will possibly cover a little bit of that tomorrow in finance, but if oh, I will hold my question, Commissioner France or Director um, uh, Rattan on that also, if you'd like to comment. Um, Madam Chair and Senator, I don't have that level of detail, but I can follow up with MDE because that, that funding will flow directly through MDE and out to school. So I can ask them that question. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, else, you're asking yeah. for the total picture. Is that correct? I, well, I was specifically looking for the education stabilization grants, oh. the, the CARES funding that is directed towards education. And I'll, I'll look for a, a closer reply on that. So, and then Madam Chair, mm -hmm. th thank you. And my last question, one of the biggest ones that our schools are facing has to do with um, internet access or our students having the devices. And yesterday in our E12, hearing, I was a little shocked to find out that the uh, department uh, is just now getting uh, a, a census on how many students have internet access and have uh, access to devices. And uh, that, I just have to say, that is a huge concern going forward. We're not sure what the fall is going to look like, but we do know that distance learning is going to continue to grow and be an important part of our kids' education, but they have to have access. And so, um, you, you told me about the CARES funding. Uh, can you talk about specific funding for broadband uh, to help with this digital divide uh, uh, um, amongst our students? What is available there? Uh, what's been spent? What can we still access? Budget Director Rattan. Um, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, I think some states are using it for broadband access. Um, I don't believe the guidance calls that out calls that out as a specific allowable use, but I think some states are using it for that purpose. Okay, thank you, Senator Nelson. 
Um, well, that that's good. Yeah, I'll look for the further uh, details on my earlier questions later. Thank you very much. And Thank you. Madam Chair, yes, I'm just just to follow up. I'm getting a, a text from my budget analysts that cover E12, and they said the money has not come in yet for the education stabilization dollars from the federal government. Oh. Thank you. Let us know when they do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and then next, uh, Senator Cohn, do you are you ready, or do you want me to? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead, Madam Chair. Okay, sure. Senator Cohn. So, as as the minority lead, I'd, I'd like to uh, have a couple of, some questions and a couple of thoughts. Senator Cohn, we cannot yes. hear you. So, uh, sorry. Sorry. yep, sorry. Them up okay. there. I apologize. So, I, I started to say, as the minority lead, I, I have a some questions of Dr. Makitas, uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, let me just begin. Uh, Sir Nelson just indicated that we were all shot. I don't know, I wasn't. I talked about this last week on the floor and uh, I wasn't very shot uh, two days ago. Um, and, and yesterday on the floor, I suggested everybody read, I've been their homework assignment, everybody read the, the budget analysis put out by MMB. And I've, I've Gone through these things over the years, but you ought to all look at it right now. Um, I, Madam Chair, with, with, with apologies, uh, um, I don't engage in revisionist history, but, I, but I'm forced to say this. I, I kidded my commissioner my friends about this yesterday. Relative to the budget reserve, uh, boy, I'm really happy it's there at, at the 2.3 billion. I just want to point out it was members of this committee, finance committee, who did this. In 2014, it was uh, Senator Scoy and myself. Period. Um, uh, House Democrats didn't like the idea of putting one third of the budget surplus into the uh, uh, reserve. Uh, Senate Republicans, I'm less sure. I can tell you. Uh, I want to be a little bit careful, Commissioner, that some of the commissioners at that time were supportive. I know Commissioner Showalter, and I dealt with him more because Commissioner Franz, you were revenue at that point. Um, Governor Dayton really wasn't very crazy about the idea. Um, and it was the Senate majority at that time, uh, Senator Scoy, myself, uh, Senator Bach, we were the ones who did it. So for whatever that's worth, I, I'm normally not a self-aggrandizing person, but I just wanted to set the history straight. No, that's um, good so, move. So let me, so let me um, um, Madam Chair. Senator, Senator um, I can't hear you anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking, I'm looking at some notes, I apologize. All right. yeah, that's right. Let me put the notes right in front of me. Um, Dr. Klomikidis. Um, let me make it clear that the IHS numbers go to the end of March. Is that correct in terms of their projection? Am I, am I stating that correctly, Dr. Dr. Um Senator, I'm, I'm not sure I know what you mean. You, they were, the forecast was released at the beginning of April, if that's, if that's what you're getting. Yeah, at. Yes. So, Sorry. so. So your budget forecast doesn't take into account what might be happening during, uh, what happened during the month of April, at, at least insofar as IHS is concerned. Dr. Columba mm -hmm. Uh Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, Senator, the, yeah, the, U, the U.S. forecast does not take into consideration what happened throughout the month of April. However, our revenue forecast, we had the, the advantage of having being having a chance to review the IHS forecast in the context of what was going on in April and um, adjust our revenue forecast uh, accordingly, and we did. So we yeah. made changes in our revenue forecast for what we think IHS is going to release in their next outlook, including we expect them, because over the course of April, unemployment insurance claims went up so much we expect that their next outlook is going to have an increase in unemployment. And so we revised downward our estimate of yeah. minimum wage and salary income accordingly. And when is their next outlook going to be released? Dr. Columba Kiedis? Madam Chair, Senator Cohen, it's due today. Okay. Senator Cohen? And Dr. Dr. Cohen, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Madam Chair, Dr. Columba Kiedis, um, let, me, let me ask you, you you've emphasized that the strength of of the economy uh, during uh, up until this cliff has been consumer confidence. Is, is that a fair statement? Dr. Columba Keyes. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, yes. Con consumer spending has been the engine of the expansion. And so both 
the means to spend, so how much money, income, and wealth consumers have, and their competence in the economy have been critical. Dr. 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 Madam Chair, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, Madam Chair, and Dr. Pumakitas, a question I've asked, and it, it's a difficult question. You really can't take into account the psychology of consumer confidence. What I mean by that is that, um, so the economy starts to come back. Stores are open, restaurants are open. Uh, uh, maybe large events are trying to do something, uh, movie theater, something like that. Um, what happens if there is this pervasive fear among a, a significant part of the public? Um, and they are just scared to show up in crowds. Or uh, additionally, uh, even if uh, people are working again, their psychology is they're going to hold on to their money. They're not going to get the new dishwasher tomorrow. We're going to wait and make sure we're at the end of this because this is such an overwhelming event. Um, and I realize I'm probably posing a question that can't be answered other than in the subjective. But I'm just wondering how that factors in, not so much today, but next year. Dr. Colombo Kitas, your thoughts? Yes, uh, Madam Chair, Senator. Uh, under normal circumstances, and these are not, but under normal circumstances, macroeconomic forecasters do have models for forecasting consumer confidence. They know the kinds of things that consumers care about, and they track those things, and they do forecast consumer sentiment, consumer confidence. That, that is true, but these are not normal circumstances. You have hit on an important risk in this economic outlook, is that our, in a lot of ways, our economic models are are poorly suited for this environment because we've never seen it before. And so no one knows for sure how consumers are going to react to the changing circumstances. And that is a source of the continued volatility in the US economic outlook and in what happens here in Minnesota. So Senator I'm sure a couple more things if I might. Um, Dr. Klimakitas, um, I apologize for playing cross-examining attorney where I, 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 you know, the rule, the rule of cross-examination is you don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. So <laughs> apologies, uh, Madam Chair and Dr. Um I was very struck and, and Madam Chair, I think we don't know who exactly were the participants, not participants, but listening on the council phone call last week or two weeks ago, you, I think you listened in as, as did I. Mm -hmm. um, I was very struck, Dr. Makitas, at the divergence from the consul. And I think you had eight of nine people who were present, I believe. Um, the divergence of what they were thinking from at least the IHS numbers they saw then. And I was very struck. I'm just wondering if there's in, in your uh, projection, not summary, but uh, it's not a book this, this time around, it's only about 13, 14 pages. I was very struck in terms of the Council of Economic Advisors statement, which you've always, which has always been in the book, as to how negative they were from what they were hearing at that time, and and how they thought this is going to get a lot worse before it gets any better. Is that a fair characterization of where the Council was, Dr. Kolomakitis? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Cohen, um, the so. Let me just take the opportunity to, to express my appreciation for the fact that the council jumped in and, and was able to, uh, to have a, a meeting and share their views um, under unusual circumstances. We don't normally ask them to do that, so I'm glad they were able to. Um, and their statement speaks for them, it speaks for itself uh, in the, the document that we released. They were, I, as I believe I wrote in the, as we wrote in the statement, um, they were particularly concerned about a couple of things. They were concerned, uh, a couple of them were concerned about um, that IHS appeared to have, uh, ha IHS did have forecasts for a couple of variables that are highly volatile, generally the stock market, S&P 500 and corporate profits that recovered their, where their pre-recession levels and then exceeded them next year. And so there were council members who said that seems, it seems like a less aggressive 
uh, recovery in those variables would be prudent. And as a consequence, uh, and also because we agreed with that, when we looked at it, we thought the same thing. And so we revised down those two variables when before we used them in our projection. And the S&P 500 shows up in the income tax forecast and the corporate profits um, forecast shows up in the corporate, pro in the corporate tax projection. Um, another thing that I think it's, it's fair to say there was a consensus of concern about was um, not being certain how this pandemic was going to play out through the course of this year and whether there was gonna be, as I think it was, um, was it Senator Benson earlier who said, uh, what if there's a, what if there's a, a, another a resurgence, um, a, you know, a W-shaped recovery rather than a U or a swoosh? Uh, and so um, that's something that they were concerned about. And um, partly because of that, but also uh, you also alluded to Senator Cohen that in the course of April, Informate, we collected more information, not a lot, but there was some information. And one of the pieces of information that came out during the course of April was the continued um, climb in unemployment insurance claims. And we do expect IHS in their next outlook to, that when they release it, they will have a higher forecast for unemployment at the US level. And expecting that, anticipating that, it was a bit of a risk on our part, but expecting that, we downward revised our um, projection of Minnesota wage and salary income, thinking that, well, if the US unemployment rate is higher than what IHS said in their April outlook, Minnesota's unemployment rate is likely to be higher than, um, than what our models would naively project. And so we downward, revi downward revised that. So, um, so that's, the, that, that's how I read the council meeting um, and the council statement and how we reacted to it. Thank you, and Madam Chair. Um, one very quick question, I have, and then I have a statement I'd like to make. Um, uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Patrick Makedis, I think you've also emphasized because of delay in sales tax and income tax payments, you don't have complete information for our state because we, the reason we've delayed those payments, and you won't see that until uh, what, uh, July, August. And, and I think it, is the intent to have, because uh, again, you, you've made it very clear, this is a budget projection, not a forecast. It, was it your intent then to have a, a fuller forecast at the end of the summer? Dr. Kolombakidis. Madam Chair, Senator Cohen, we don't have a timetable for an update. Okay. Uh, the, we, we have to remain flexible and uh, you know, continue to observe what's going on. And you're right that the payment delays are one of the big things that we'll be watching. But let me just quickly add the two other things that, that I wanna see play out um, before we make adjustments is I wanna see the US outlook stabilize because to, for us to, to ride a wave of volatile um, economic outlooks, I don't think is going to be useful or informative for you. Uh, and the third thing, so the payment delays, the U.S. outlook stabilized. Another thing is that we, you know, I said that the one piece of information that we have, that we have high frequency data on are these unemployment insurance claims, but we have not yet seen this really unprecedented spike in unemployment insurance claims play its way through to the official unemployment rate and to uh, income tax uh, receipts in Minnesota. So I want to see that play out so that we can understand how this very unusual spike in unemployment insurance claims that's been differentially affect that has differentially affected occupations and industries and wage levels. I want to see how that is playing in to the income tax before I make uh, adjustments. Thank you. So, Madam Senator Chair, let me let me conclude and I'll shut up. Mr. Um, has obviously laid out in, in much greater. Uh, uh, academic and, and, and uh, well, not just academic, but, but the projections, uh, the basis for this and so on, than any of us could. Uh, this is exactly why last week uh, at a micro level, I was raising concerns about Senator Westrom's bill out of the general fund. Um, and it's not my intent to get back into a debate about anything like that, except to say that we've never seen this before and I, I've been through 
uh, peaks and valleys. Um, and either as a minority leader or, or chairman, I think I have uh, a finance chairman of full committee, uh, 28 years doing this stuff. And I will let me just offer a warning, members of both majority and minority who intend to be on this committee next year. If folks on this committee uh, and, and the full Senate, and Madam Chair, this is not directed at yourself or any individual, this is just collective at all of us. If the intent is to figure out who can get the edge over the governor, who can get the edge over the majority, who can get the edge over the person who sits next to me, who do that kind of stuff, and you come back in January, and you haven't started to follow, I'll suggest what I hope ultimately the governor will do is to, is to set the stage for trying to deal with this during this year. If we continue to play these kind of games lead, leading into an election to try to get the edge in, in the electoral process, whoever shows up in this legislature next January, is arguably going to have a huge problem to take care of for this biennium. Just give it a try. When you have to cut billions of dollars with only 25% of the biennium left. I promise you, it'll be the most miserable session anybody has ever spent. And we've had touches of that before. Nowhere near what the state could well face next year. And I would just implore folks like I said, the entirety of the committee, Madam Chair, with your leadership, just be careful. Um, Commissioner Franz has spoken in his usual, very measured, and and um, I'm trying to think of other adjectives, Commissioner, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it to a measured, measured way. We <laughs> have to be careful. Listen I can give you some more. Yeah. <laughs> listen, listen to the Commissioner. Um, you know, we're all, you know, if I can say this, Madam Chair, Commissioner Franz came into this administration without a partisan political background. And he ran a business, he was a partner at a major law firm. Um, if we don't take this seriously and, and put aside some of the, the back and forth, and I've engaged in lots of the back and forth over the years. I'm not immune, I've not been immune to that. Just wait till next year. Just wait, because you will have never seen anything like it. So thank you, Madam Chair. On that optimistic note, uh, let's go on to the others. Just, um, just a comment and maybe a question back to you. I'm glad that you recognize, well, we're glad that you have done all this work to create a reserve and your experience is, is, is vastly appreciated. Uh, I do have a little questions. I'm gonna push back on you a little bit because I heard an insinuation of games being played and that this, this committee does not take it serious. Because we have, as the Senate Republican majority, been through a $6.5 billion deficit yes. in a very short amount of time. And so we, we can handle it. We did. We solved the budget. Um, and we'll, we'll continue to solve this budget. But I do not want anybody to think that you are insinuating there are games being played. Yeah, ma Madam Chair, let me apologize for that. That was, that was a rhetorical flourish. Um, um, I was talking about was not so much games being played, but we try to get the political edge um, one way or another. And, and, and there's no question, everybody's engaged in that, not in terms of games, but in terms of, of how we've approached things. I'm, I'm just suggesting that this is not business as usual. And, and I recognize, uh, to be honest, Madam Chair, I'm glad you mentioned the work that you did in 2011, 2012, because I'll tell you, what I told my caucus at that time when we came back to the minority was, this is going to be a, a very difficult time, and and uh, 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 you know they're going to have a very hard time doing this, and and that was the case. So, so I apologize for trying to suggest that that um, uh, you were engaging in games. Uh, again, just take it as a rhetorical flourish. I was trying to, I'm just trying to emphasize that uh, folks over not just ne this next ten days. But what's going to be probably over this calendar year are going to have to be dead serious. Dr. Klimakidis has made it clear in her measured, more academic poems that uh, this is going to get worse before it gets better. We don't have all the information. Senator Benson was, was the person who was most prescient in saying what happens when we get um, you know, the second wave and, and how is that factored in. Um, so I, I just, you've been through this. I've been through this, not to the extent of 11-12, but remember I was chairman in the run-up to 2011. 
and I know how difficult it was to put things together in that 2010 session. And I just think that uh, 2010 will, will look like the proverbial cakewalk compared to where we are now. Well, thank you, Senator Cohen. And um, <clears throat> just to add a note before we go to Senator Ingebrigtsen, we, um, this is when our finance committee members kicks in right now. And we will be doing a lot of this Zooming because we have a lot of serious work ahead of us. And um, we don't play games on this. We don't have time for games. And frankly, I hate games. So we're going to buckle up this next uh, 10 days and we're going to get our work done. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Madam Chair. Senator Cohen. Two, two seconds. You're right. I, I've, I've enjoyed working with you as, as chairman. Obviously, I could rewrite history. I, I'd still be chairman. Okay, uh, that's the way things work. Um, but I think you've done a very good job in chairing the committee, and, and I know how serious you've been about things. So I, I'm sorry for, again, my rhetorical flourish. But uh, oh, well, no, Senator Cohen, you've had 26 or 28 years. Well, as a as a chair as a chairman chair. or a minority, 28. 20, so, no, as a chair. 26, right? Chair, chair, okay, let's see. Uh, uh, 28, 28 minus 6, 22 years as a chairman. Well, that's, well you you have the right to voice your opinion. And for, for, for whatever it's worth, whatever it's worth um, I, I'm the second longest finance chair in the history of the state. Yeah, there you just, go. Just, just so you know, you and I cannot be A.J. Rockney, who was chairman for 30 years of the Finance Committee, when we're only about four accounts in the state budget. <laughs> that's right. Don't know, I don't want to beat that one, but... Um, you definitely have a right to um, offer some uh, sage advice, Senator Cohen. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you to the presenters. Uh, Senator Cohen, I think when you got to be chairman that many years ago, they were using rocks, I think, instead of gavels. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's really dating you, and, and I really appreciate the, uh, the comments from Senator Cohen. Uh, uh, very prudent. I, I was there when, uh, uh, when we moved uh, that that legislation forward to put the reserves in there. And in fact, I think, uh, you know, if I think back, I think my vote was the deciding vote. So I think I'll have to go, we'll just go with that for today. But anyhow, uh, he is certainly starting to sound more conservative than, than, uh, than most times. But uh, the question I have, and, and I appreciate the testifiers, and, and uh, one of the things that stood out with uh, of the presentation with the commissioner was, uh, working collectively with the legislator moving legislature moving forward, um, does this suggest, Commissioner, that uh, Governor Walls is open to uh, utilizing all 201 of us legislators when it comes to appropriating the federal money coming in? Uh, is that a fair assessment? And then I have a couple of other questions as well. Thank you, Senator Persons. Uh, Commissioner France. Uh, Madam Chair and Senator, uh, we're clearly uh, Governor Walls and his experience as a legislator himself in Congress uh, appreciates and understands the legislative process and the, and the important role that, that we all play together. And I think one of the things we continually ex express and learn is the ability to get different viewpoints and uh, and we want to we want to work with the uh, legislature on all things. But I think the, the on the federal funds issue, I think it's. The, the key here is making sure that uh, we have a process to respond in, in an emergency situation. What's unusual about this situation is how quickly things can change. I remember, I think it was last Thursday, <clears throat> a week ago, Thursday, we were working on a proposal to work uh, with the swine disposal problem in, in South Southern Minnesota and how quickly that was changing. And we had put together what we had hoped to be a request for the legislature to to move quickly on that and, and look into that and, and make some funds available. But over the weekend, it just things continued to deteriorate and change so rapidly. The number of, uh, of swine hogs that had to be disposed of on a daily basis was growing. And uh, you know we collectively worked with a number of folks. Uh, Senator Cohen and I, uh, Senator uh, Rosa and I talked a lot and so did uh, Chair Carlson in the House. And, and other people talked about, well, what can we can we do that or should we just go ahead with the emergency funding we did the emergency funding because uh, it was moving so fast and so i think our main concern is, is setting up an, an arrangement where where we do work together as collaboratively we collaboratively as we can in all cases but there are also are some emergency situations and i and so the the current process that the federal funds sitting in the account provides for the legislative oversight through the LAC. And we know, we know that's not a perfect system, 
but what we would like to do is work on, for example, on the local distribution, there's $667 million that's potentially available to local units of government. And I know we're working now, Commissioner Bowery is working with leads in both the Senate and the House to try to put together a process, legislative process, to figure out how that should work. Because I think collectively, and that's a great legislative process, collectively, how do we hear people? What, what are the right, how do we equitably distribute money to local units of government and get it done quickly? So th those are the challenges. So you have our commitment to work together. We, I think we're just concerned about making sure we have a process that works in, a, in an emergency situation. So. Well, I'm glad to hear that, I, uh, Commissioner. Right. It just, it seems to, uh, excuse me, Madam Chair, the uh, the idea of, of uh, you know, some Minnesotans uh, don't, don't want to get into this political thing, and I think Senator Cohen hit on this very well. And, you know, instead of just one of us going down making the decisions, all 202 of, or excuse me, 102, uh, 101 of us and, and a governor making decision, it makes it a little more, a little more to easy, easy to live with. And we certainly have to be careful here because of the report that was just given here. I have one more question, and, and it's, and it was touched on a little bit uh, with regards to legacy and uh, uh, as well as the uh, LCCMR projections. Now those bills have not been uh, passed yet. And I know there's been some caution moving forward because uh, in the legacy bill, we're talking uh, nearly $327 million. Uh, Senator Root is, uh, is handling that herself and her committee. LCCMR, uh, another 60 some million. Um, you know what? What can we get some uh, some ideas as to what uh, what projections or what kind of uh, uh, cuts maybe we could anticipate and do that up front so we don't have to dig ourselves out of a hole next year? Uh, or maybe Senator Rosen can answer that as well. Commissioner France or our Deputy Director. Well, let me let me start off, uh, Madam Chair and Senator, and we're working on those numbers now. And you're right. Um, once we get the information about where we are with these funds and, and, and how some of these funds live off of the receipts, we have to move quickly because as you uh, aptly note, every day that goes by, we're spending money there that we may not have. And so what we're working on is trying to get the best estimates as we can to start making those adjustments sooner rather than later. All, all that budget director Raton described that process. Director Raton. Um, Madam Chair and Senator, we do, we do have estimates um, for a select uh, group of other funds in our consolidated fund statement. Um, we don't have a full uh, revised consolidated fund statement, but the legacy fund statements were updated. So we are starting to look at what um, would need to be reduced in those funds. I believe we will be having some communication coming shortly on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And and again, I, I got my numbers confused this morning, but there's uh, 201 of us uh, plus the governor. So I, I think the uh, the prudent thing to do would be to to have us all involved in this. And and if you want to talk about non-politics, say, and maybe I'm wrong. You know, I I, I know that when you throw money at, at legislators, uh, the politics uh, sometimes start up. But I think right now everybody's uh, understanding that we are in a very tight, very tough situation and. And uh, anybody that's going to play any games is uh, uh, politically is going to hurt uh, this coming November for sure. So thank you very much for the report. Thank you, Senator Ingebrigtsen. And members, um, on Monday morning at our finance hearing, you're going to, we're going to have the first introduction of Senate file 4564, which is the coronavirus relief uh, account bill that is, is going to distribute the dollars to our local governments. And we will have, um, I would, is it this Monday? No, actually, I think it's this Friday. No, it's Monday, actually. Um, we're going to have a very lengthy conversation about that. Um, so um, we have a lot of work to do this Friday, tomorrow, and on Monday on this very issue. Senator Limmer is up next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the question I had, and I may have a couple questions, but uh, the first one is, is interest rates in relationship to the bonding bill. Are interest rates still relatively low? Uh, is it a good thing to invest in our bonding bill process with a large figure uh, in relationship to the interest rate that's being offered today? Who would like to take that one? Well, let me start, Madam Chair, and then, um, you know, what's, it's a great question. One of the things that we always examine is the market. So uh, 
typically, as you know, we pass the bonding bill in May, and then we get the uh, bonding uh, projects ready to see what uh, what cash they actually need and what what cash we need from the year before his bonding bill. We put that that all together in a bonding package in August. We typically go to market go to market in August, and that's when the investors sort of expect us to show up, and and our bonds really sell very very well. They've always sold very well, and even better now as AAA. So there is always the, the analyzing the market uh, situation as a component of any bonding uh, sale, bond sale. This year it's even more critical. And so uh, currently the, the, the rates do look favorable, but what we would, would do, let's assume we pass a, a bonding bill this session. Uh, and even if we don't, we will have to probably sell some bonds to, for the cash needs from the previous bonding bill. But let's assume we pass a bonding bill this session. We would then get ready in June and July and, and then and probably go to market in August if, in fact, that makes sense. Uh, it's important for you all to know that if, in, if we have a bond sale scheduled in August under traditional measures and it's the market for some reason changes dramatically or isn't favorable, we would not sell obviously and so we have flexibility and when we can do that we, the pressures we have on the timing of the bond sale really relates to the, the need for cash in the current bonding bill or the ones that have already been passed so the, so there's always that your the question you raised is really excellent because we always have to have our eye to the market and um, i don't know if uh, dr klumkitas i don't know if you have any uh, particular insight into the, the rates right now dr klumkitas um madam chair senator um, I haven't looked at rates lately, but the the tough irony of the situation right now for states is that even though um, interest rates were were lowered by the Fed, so that the federal fund rate in this forecast is very low, which would make you you know looking out in the future, you'd say, hey, low rates, let's go ahead and borrow. It's not going to cost us anything. Um, the fact that states are in such difficult financial situation right now because of the revenue declines means that. The muni market is not as advantageous as you would expect just looking at the federal funds rate. And so, uh, as the commissioner said, you know, paying close attention to the market now matters uh, because um, you know we had earlier in well, I don't know, it's a few weeks ago or, or you know last month, you know, there was significant volatility in the in muni rates, in the muni rate. and um, the Fed has made some, uh, taken some measures to try to you know, stabilize that and other, other markets. But um, yeah, it's not as clear cut. It's a great question because it's not as clear cut as it might, you might expect it to be given the, the lack of, um, you know, lack of uh, the int low interest rates in general. The reason I asked the question was that we had an earlier discussion about the bond rating and whether or not we have a recognized plan uh, in the future. And part of that plan was whether we're overspending, overborrowing, or if we have a robust bonding bill. So um, I'm trying to define what a robust bonding bill would be in light of the caution that I just heard. And maybe that's something that I could have a discussion with you offline. I know we're running out of time is getting short for our committee, Madam Chair, but I'd like to have a discussion with someone a little later uh, regarding that and maybe I'll rely on me to call you and uh, we'll do it that way. Uh, the other quick question before we sign off is, um, will unemployment checks stop soon? And is there a plan to anticipate that? if the economy doesn't rebound quickly. Commissioner Frantz. Uh, yeah, um, um, Madam Chair and Senator, you know, I don't have a lot of uh, line sight into that. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that happens is that uh, in these situations, we've seen it before where the typical pattern or the typical uh, period gets extended uh, either by the legislature for state funds or by the federal government for, for the federal uh, part of that. So. I just think it depends on sort of how deep this this unemployment goes and how deep, uh, how long the recession goes. So there are a lot of variables there, and, and clearly there's a there's a concern about how how long can we continue to fund that. So I I, I just don't know the answer to that. I don't, know, Dr. Klumbakitis, if you have any more insight. Dr. Klumbakitis, uh, Madam Chair, Senator. So I can I can tell you what we uh, what we've assumed in our 
projection. So our projection includes the unemployment benefits that the normal unemployment benefits and assuming it's a current law projection. So we're assuming that benefits will extend as long as they have been extended, will persist as long as they've been extended. So that includes the extra $600 a week from the federal government that was in the CARES Act, which will, uh, which is until the middle of July. And so at our forecast does assume, we estimated how much unemployment benefits Minnesotans were going to be getting based on our expectation about employment. Um, and that, and we also included, um, IHS had forecast uh, unemployment benefits. So that was part of the, uh, our calculus. And then we also uh, have been tracking the withholding on income tax withholding on unemployment benefits in Minnesota. And so that was part of our income tax forecast. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering how long we can keep our businesses shuttered uh, without some kind of opening, uh, a cautious opening of some sort, but just to get uh, private dollars rolling. And uh, it's, it, I have to admit, it's uh, a place we haven't been before, but it's something that we've got to try and push uh, as early as we can safely can. Yes. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Senator Limmer, for, for those comments too. We have one more, Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom, are you available? There you are. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Uh, my question uh, relates a little bit to uh, what Senator Benson uh, asked and uh, Senator Cohen might have alluded to, uh, but this report being only more of a V-curve or a Nike hash versus a W, um, and I'm just wondering, will we look at a W? Was there a reason we didn't look at both? or include a W because there does seem to be a lot of discussion and concern that um, we've slowed the spread, but it's not going to end the spread. And there likely will be a resurgence as you get into cooler and winter weather. Um, what, what are the plans for looking at a W and, uh, or, or why did you choose just, just, just the V-curve? Uh, Dr. Columbakitis. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Westrom, we used the uh, baseline forecast by IHS, which uh, has an assumption that the infections dissipate um, this summer and that we that social distancing measures are able to be lifted and that we have uninterrupted growth after that. And at the, you know, this was, as Senator Cohen noted, they generated their numbers at the end of March. They released their outlook at the beginning of April. And so things, lots of things have changed in the last few weeks. And so their outlook is going to change. I don't know. I haven't heard them say anything about um, incorporating a W, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'll say that at the time, even their pessimistic outlook did not have a W. It had uninterrupted growth, just a much deeper recession and a little bit longer. So we do, so there was no, there was no opportunity for us to, um, to use an, a US outlook that had, that incorporated a resurgence. Um, so what we will do is watch, as I said, how the US ac economic outlook changes and it will change and it will change more than we're used to. I described it a little while ago as a bit of a roller coaster. And uh, you know that when when the elements that I talked about uh, are clear, the U.S. economic outlook stabilizes. Those payment delays um, have run their course. Um, we can see in the income tax how unemployment, at the unemployment insurance claims have played through to the economy and to revenues. Um, then we can make uh, an additional uh, additional revision. Uh, but uh, until then, I I don't anticipate making an additional revision. Senator Russell. So two, two, two thoughts and a follow-up, um, Doctor. Is is one is one thought that this initial hit, uh, we level the curve, but at some point, social distancing uh, becomes 
part of the norm or a mod uh, a hybrid of it but do we anticipate that a second wave of it is probably one we we learn and rather live with uh not concerned about quite the peak we can manage it through our healthcare system much like we handle a normal flu and cold season epidemic anyways and so so the economy will be continuing continuing more normal like like it does through uh, most annual flu, flu and cold seasons and or are we just disguising uh, what could be much worse news and, and not not letting it um, uh, depress us this early in the in the process is that is that part of the motivation otherwise mm -hmm. dr columba uh madam chair senator the way to look at this there's no disguising there's no trying to make things look better than they are not either by us or by um or by the macroeconomic forecaster it's yeah. everybody trying to do the best they can with the information they have uh the IHS does not detail, does not provide their assumptions about, um, about the epidemiology in the detail that you are describing, um, which of course we're all gaming through in our heads and, and with the information that we have. So the, the best I can, best information I can give you at the moment is that uh, all of these possible different scenarios other than the uninterrupted growth that what IHS forecast in April, all of the alternative scenarios, all are elements of risk to this forecast. And so to the extent that we think that some of those scenarios are more likely, uh, then this forecast is going to be changed. It's going to look different. Uh, in my response to uh, Senator Cohen's questions, I outlined several of the things that we did in our revenue forecast to take into consideration um, concerns by uh, the Council of Economic Advisors about the aggressive, fairly aggressive return to growth in some volatile variables and about the, what we anticipate will be an upward revision in unemployment um, by IHS. And so with the information we had, we altered our revenue forecast. So in that sense, while I think there is down, primarily downside risk to the economic, the U.S. economic outlook that we used, the April outlook that IHS released, there's less downside risk, I think, with our revenue forecast because we tried to incorporate some of that as best we could with the information we had. So, Dr. Colon-Peters, you mentioned that there is not going to be another forecast. I thought at one time we were looking at an August forecast numbers. Um, Madam Chair, there there isn't a specific timeline. I, I we we have to remain flexible, and when we have information that we think will uh, be useful to you, that we're confident will be useful to you, and that we can you know add information and not add noise, then then we'll provide it. But I I don't have a timeline in front of me yet. Thank you, uh, Senator Westrom. I'm sorry, Ma but Madam Chair. Last point, uh, uh, Doctor, is it is it probably safe to say a, a second resurgence or whatever it is probably is easier to manage and we may not see the broad shutdown of business and economic activity merely for the reason of there's there's familiarity now with it there's improved treatments and uh, uh, pharmaceutical supplies of, of products that, that two months ago we didn't know uh, even helped or weren't weren't uh, being used for it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so one one can assume a resurgence is, is something we're much more resilient to be able to work through than than the than the widespread shutdown that we've probably experienced this time. Mm -hmm. Dr. Columbakitis. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, you know, intuitively that sounds that sounds right. But I have learned the you know, that many of us have limitations in how well we understand the epidemiology of this, uh, of this disease, uh, you know, myself among them. So I, yeah, it, it's possible, but I, I don't know how a second wave is going to play out. 
Uh, there are a lot of things, you know, a lot of things have happened in the last two months. Thing, the world changed very dramatically and a lot of things are going to happen in the next few months. So um, I hope you're right. I hope you're right that if that a second wave will be easier to manage, uh, but I don't have any, any specific uh, expertise on that. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Senator Westrom. Dr. Kalimbakitis, just a quick question and then we're gonna uh, close here. And one for Commissioner uh, France. Is the housing market, since the interest rates, rates are low, is the housing market, has that been affected? And are you going to see that stall? And Because from what I understand, there are still, it's still, it's still very healthy, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, Madam Chair, the, the housing market took a big hit at the beginning of this. Uh, some construction, uh, you know, new construction was, I'm talking about nationwide, some new construction was, had to be shut down. Um, and uh, the, and sales of existing homes, as you can imagine, has had to retool and figure out how are we going to do this when, in a low touch way. Um, and so in the macro forecast, housing has, it has a negative, it has been revised downward from what it was in February. But there, but I think the both construction, new construction and sales of new homes have started to pick back up. So, um, I think, the, I guess the, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think the way to think about it is that it took a big hit at the very beginning and, and the outlook was revised downward, but I wouldn't be surprised if that a downward revision gets revised upward as we figure out how to, as the real real estate industry figures out how to sell homes under these circumstances. And that would be a very good indicator of, of consumer confidence. If that starts to go, I would assume. Yep, yep. Madam Chair, it may, may well be, yeah. And also an indicator of the creativity and the in, the ingenious of, um, of the business sector who so very much want to get back to um, doing their business. And so, you know, we'll figure out how to do it in a safe way. Right. Well, everything is going virtual, you know, actually works. It, it does. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. And it's one more world. question, um, Commissioner France, on the cash flow account of 350, was that, is that part of your, I didn't see it in your last slide there. So I was just wondering how, if that's being accounted for. And I, Commissioner France, you. Yep, I'm moved, I turned it off. Okay. Uh, well, so, you know, um, you'll recall, um, Madam Chair, back in 2011, uh, with the six over $6 billion deficit, how we were trying to figure our way out of that one. And there were points where some of the projections we were using, a big chunk of the uh, cash account. Uh, it, it is, uh, we don't, it's not anticipated to be used uh, at this point. It's there, and uh, it certainly uh, can be accessed, but, but our, our current projection uh, just shows that the reserve is there at 2.359 billion. The cash is there at 350 million. And you and I have talked individually about the cash account, whether we need to grow that in the future. But so uh, there's no there's no change to that under our, any current analysis right now. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you, members. We went a little past our uh, time, and I appreciate your indulgence, uh, Commissioner France, Dr. Kolumbakitis, and uh, Budget Director. Ratan, thank you very much for being here this morning and giving us all your time. I do appreciate that. Members, we do have a hearing tomorrow starting at 8.30 a.m. We're going to be going through 4565, which is the federal conversion bill that Budget Director Ratan made reference to. Um, and then also we have 4481 is Paul Anderson's bill. It's the grants for small businesses. And then Monday, we have Senate File 4564, which is the the conversation uh, and starting this bill of, of the local distribution of the Federal CARES Act to our local governments and how that's going to be, uh, what kind of percentage, how that's going to look. So uh, with that, members, um, look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye, you guys.